Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant. Here we use the exacting tools of a combined audiovisual medium to dissect statistics in everyday life. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be wielding the scalpel of statistical uncertainty. Assisting me today and covered in the viscera of an unsuspecting percentage, it's Bart. How's it going? Good. Um, so I go by he and him, and since the last episode, I've started suing fit people for saying that I have a foot fetish, which I'm sure is not suspicious at all. I think it's an ankle fetish, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're moving up with the world, quite literally. <laughs> well, up the body, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You keep going higher, and you'll be almost generic once you get to the thigh. The knee's <laughs> going to be a bit of a weird one. I mean, I'm sure it exists. We live on the internet. <laughs> this is true. I'm not going to search for it, though. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, which is the primary way that inflation is calculated. We'll be talking from the Australian context mostly, though we're going to look at some recent efforts in the UK to change the calculation in order to better reflect what people actually experience. To start with, we're going to talk through what the CPI is as a statistic. Here, it's calculated by the Australian Bureau of Statistics every three months, based on the change in price for a whole range of different goods and services, so it measures the sort of average price of stuff over time. There are actually two moving targets here for this, how this relates to your experience spending money. What it takes for you to earn a dollar with regards to your labour, which isn't measured by the CPI, and what your dollar can buy as the price of goods and services change. We'll talk about this more when we get to how it's used. For the statistic itself, the ABS does a whole bunch of data collection in capital cities, and only capital cities, which we'll talk about, to see how the cost of a standard basket of goods and services changes. What's in the basket is kind of grouped into 11 things. Here they are. You can see that we have what you think of as like typical household expenditure stuff here in terms of like consumables, but you've also got clothing, housing, which uh, there are different calculations that go into dealing with rent versus mortgages, furnishing equipment, and like broadly other stuff, right? Insurance and financial services does include what um, your middle class people might pay to financial advisors or uh, what your upper class people pay to their very good accountants. I mean, yeah, and the middle classes go to accountants as well. True, true. Generally not quite <laughs> the same way though. It's very interesting. Uh, so I come from quite a wealthy background. Uh, so my partner comes from a slightly more wealthy background. And it is very interesting to see where that divide sits between the middle class who go to financial advisors to get advice on where to spend their money are the upper class who use accountants for basically the same thing. Yeah. And uh, the advice I got from one of the wealthy people in that extended family is basically that you can tell the accountants are a better idea because the financial planners pay accountants. <laughs> Each of these has a number of different items in it. You wind up with about 800 are measured across the whole range. And each item has a number of different prices that get aggregated together. I think a 400 gram can of kidney beans. There are a bunch of different brands at different prices, so your average cost of kidney beans is the first level of aggregation. To calculate the average cost of beans for this quarter, or any other product, the ABS gets a whole bunch of data together. For stuff like groceries, it will scrape data from online stores, ring up or visit shops, and use administrative data about transactions. Some of the items in these baskets fluctuate more frequently in price than others, so depending on what you're measuring, you have to go out and collect data more often. Education fees, for example, in Australia, these are indexed once per year, so you only have to sample that once per year. But fresh fruit and vegetable prices can change multiple times over the course of a three-month period, so you have to measure them repeatedly instead. So when you say the average price, is that between like the lowest price version of it and the highest price? Is that so, how it plays out? So as far as I can tell, uh, it's quite literally the mean. So if you have, and we'll, we'll look a bit at this later when we go through an example, if you have half a, different tins, half a dozen different tins of beans, the cheapest one is 80 cents, the most expensive one is $2.50, say, you'll take a mean of those. Okay, right. Yeah. 
You also have to take into account things like seasonal produce that's available and produce quality, and there are adjustments that the ABS makes for those. We're not going to get into quite that level of gory technical detail. For a particular item, you have a calculated index. So the CPI of an item is equal to the current basket price. This might be the average of your beans, for example, divided by the basket price from a reference year times 100. We have a reference or base year because the CPI is about change over time. Currently, our reference year in Australia is the 2011 to 2012 financial year. This changed then. It was like, uh, I think prior to that, it was sometime in the 90s. Prior to that, it was sometime in the 80s. It's basically so you have a, an index or which is more relevant to what people are experiencing at the time. Unfortunately, this means that your boomer parents have an unrealistic perspective on what actually things actually cost compared to income, for example. Certainly. So let's have a look at index values. If you get a CPI for an item equals to 100, that means that it is the same price now as it was in the reference year. If you get 200, the price has doubled, right? Because you can think of this as kind of a percentage, really. If you get 105, you've had an increase of 5%. This is not quite the same as inflation. So to get an inflation, uh, you have to do a slightly different calculation, which is current minus reference, uh, current basket price minus reference basket price, sorry, divided by reference basket price, and then you multiply that by 100. But this actually becomes a rather simpler calculation if you already have done this, because you can break up this fraction and you get current divided by reference minus reference divided by reference. All of that gets multiplied by 100. But this is your CPI, right? So what you, well, this multiplied by 100 is your CPI. So what you actually get out of here is the CPI minus 100, because this becomes one. Yeah. So if we come back to our examples here, so this is your inflation. If we're going to look at inflation, 100% uh, would be zero inflation, 200% would be 100% one, uh, inflation, because we usually talk about inflation as a percentage. Our 105 CPI would be our 5% inflation. What happens with uh, new things that need to be paid for, but that have only just emerged? Like it's only been in the last, say, 20 years that the internet has become a need that you've needed to pay for. What gets measured in these different buckets actually changes slightly over time. Um, because the ABS wants its metric for inflation to be uh, relevant, it does update what it counts from time to time. It still may or may not reflect exactly what people on the street purchase, but broadly speaking, it does. So because we are looking at a reference year 2011 to 2012, things that you were buying in 2011, 2012 will be in there. So stuff like internet, mobile phones, mobile data. The one consideration here is that this inflation metric is inflation relative to the reference year. It's not the inflation that you actually see cited in like news reports or whatever, because this is with respect to 2011, 2012. If you want to look at the inflation for a single interval, one quarter, you have to look at the difference in CPIs from one quarter to the next and convert that to a proportion of the first. So we start with the difference, which is CPI2 minus CPI1, which will give us the difference in the values. And then to make it proportional to CPI1, we divide by CPI1. So for our example, imagine we have uh, 123.2 minus 119.5. These are proportional to the original reference here. Then we divide by 119.5 and we get 3.1% inflation. But we've calculated this on a per item level, right? So this is your beans, your internet bill, whatever else. It is already an aggregation because it's the average of those, but that's just one item from those 800 items. Once that has been done, this needs to be further aggregated because the items aren't all going to have the same change. 
So they are clustered into 87 classes of similar objects or services, and the CPI of those ca- each of those classes is calculated. As like 87. I, I know it's so complex. <laughs> like, this is one of the reasons that I wanted to do this episode because this is something that gets quoted so much, and the actual process is really quite intense. I mean, the data collection alone is a huge project. These classes, the 87 different classes, each get a weighting to reflect how much of them people buy. This is based on a survey of households and how much they spend on different things. Basically, a proportion of total household spending in each of those 87 classes. And this is the sort of thing that they look at. So um, this is for the 11, not the 87, because there's two different classification systems running around here. But <laughs> like this is a sort of data you use to do that weighting, right? So you can see, like, here's the food and non-alcoholic beverages thing, right? Here is transport. And you can see where COVID hit because transport spending <laughs> dropped, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so this is indexed to June 2018 is 100%. And then you look at the different levels of spending compared to that, basically. So this is not the precise weighting that is used because this is for the 11, not the 87. But this is an idea, right? Yeah. Incidentally... If you are going to do an aggregated statistic, data like this is what you need to justify your aggregation. So you compare this to that Bloomberg ranting of countries by COVID resilience where they just kind of pulled out of their ass, oh, we're going to weight everything the same. You actually need to justify that. And this is what justification in this context would look like. Yeah. So the CPI overall is a weighted average of the classes. So what I mean by that is you take um, CPI for class one, you multiply it by the weight for class one, and then you add the same thing for CPI class two times weight of class two up to your 87th or 11th, depending on how you're dividing these up. Yeah. Let's go 87. My handwriting is getting worse as it gets smaller, right? <laughs> And like you then, if your weights add up to one, you don't need to do this. But if your weights don't add up to one, you can give this as a valid calculation by just having down the bottom all the weights added up. Yep. So you divide the weights added up by you, the. You divide of this multiplication here. So each of these multiplications gets kind of done individually. Yep. And then you add them up. Divide by the sum of the weights. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So the weights represent the proportion of overall spending in that class. If your food expenses are 40% of your spending and that increases, it's going to have more of an impact on the cost of living to you than if something which is 5% of your spending goes up. The weights usually add up to one. So if they do add up to one, then this part on the bottom goes away because dividing by one doesn't change anything. But for convenience, because you don't actually need them to add up to one, you can do this and you get the same result out. So that's how CPI is calculated. Let's talk about what it's used for. Broadly, anything which needs a metric for inflation tends to use CPI. Outside of government, it's often used to compare to wages on the basis that if the inflation for a year is 10%, you've actually lost income if you don't have a 10% pay rise that year as well. Yep. Uh, this is very relevant to any of you who are employed, and you should look very closely at these numbers to make sure that your living standards are not actually declining. It's a it's a a rough estimate for you to use uh, on your on like the level of an individual, but it's an argument you should be able to make. Within the Australian government, it's used for things like interest rate decisions. The Reserve Bank has a quote unquote target level of inflation, which is two to three percent averaged over time. And it will do things like change the interest rate as a lever to adjust this. This metric is related to what the Reserve Bank considers uh, the target level of unemployment. See yep. our episode on employment statistics, which I can't remember the number of off the top of my head for more details on that. Basically, the uh, capitalist economic argument is that if wages go up, that is the cost of labor increases, then that will push up inflation. Hmm interesting i have heard um that 
uh, it would be a more liberatory economics if we allowed for slightly more inflation under the Reserve Bank. Is there an argument to be made for that? Um, yes, in the sense that w- the way that it is constructed with that relationship between like unemployment and labour power and inflation, if you allow for more inflation, that means basically you can allow for greater wage growth. Right. But notice this calculation doesn't actually directly relate to wages. It relates to the cost of um, products, which is wages plus surplus value plus material cost. And that surplus value can blow up even if wages don't change. Which it has since the 1970s, I'm led to believe. Oh boy, has it ever. (laughs) (laughs) So within the Reserve Bank, it's used for interest rates in general. Um, that's kind of something that the banks relate to with regards to mortgage, uh, mortgage interest rates and also, uh, returns and savings. But here, student loan interest is directly linked to the CPI. So if you've got student debt in Australia, this consumer price index is what leads to that costing more and more over time, basically. Welfare payments are also indexed in this way, though pensions get a slightly different one because they have the higher of the CPI or a cost of living index, whereas people on unemployment benefits, they only get the CPI. Yeah. The tax office also uses it for asset valuation over time. The last thing I'm going to mention, though there's probably a bunch of other policies I haven't seen or know about, is excise duties on alcohol and the like. Your beers! It affects the cost of the beers, mate. <laughs> How dare they? I know, right? Ugh. The CPI is not without problems. First, it's used as a national statistic, but as I mentioned, data is only collected in state and territory capital cities. That means we have a biased sample. Only about two-thirds of the population actually live in those cities, and there are very real differences between the costs and lives of people in cities compared to outside. For example, if you live in a remote Aboriginal community with really desperate food poverty, where the one shop near you is selling wilted spinach for $20 a kilo, that's a wildly different experience to Sydney. Absolutely. Especially if they've got, um, what are those cards called? Um, Oh yeah, the end you, the the welfare cards. Yeah. Yeah. Because that is just a license to gouge. It's a license to gouge, and also people in those remote communities don't get welfare proportionate to the cost of living there. Yeah. Which means that their poverty is all the more desperate. It also means that if you have skyrocketing rent in rural areas because people are leaving the cities as a result of being able to work remotely and living in cities is not very nice for them, that's not captured in the CPI. And that means, like, you can have really huge increase in the cost of living in these regional areas, and at the national stage, everyone thinks it's fine. This is broadly true of housing, incidentally. It's quite incredible. Like, um, so I'm from a tourist town, so obviously people tend to move there as, like, their desirable place to live. And there are places in Yarrawonga that go for a million bucks now. Like, yeah. Pretty obscene. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And not what you'd expect either, I would say. Oh, it's I don't know. Like I, I, 5,000 people. I, I don't know. I live in Sutherland, so I live in Sydney, <laughs> so what I expect to go for a million dollars can be quite crap, frankly. I mean, yeah, we both live in, <laughs> we both Capital live in very expensive suck. cities. <laughs> yeah. The other kind of main problem with the CPI, other than questions about what's actually counted, is that this isn't stratified by different cost of living, or by income. This really matters because the aggregation mechanism doesn't account for the variation in price of particular items, only the change in the average. So to cite my sources, this episode was actually inspired by Jack Munro, who is Bootstrap Cook on Twitter, a campaigner against poverty in the UK. They have been pushing for changes to how CPI is calculated and used over there because of shortcomings like this. I've put links to their material in the description. The main point that Munro makes is that the disappearance of cheap brands disproportionately affects the poorest people and isn't captured in this CPI. So we're going to work through an example with beans. Imagine that you live on Centrelink in Australia, a welfare benefit system for the unaware. Because you are well below the poverty line, you are currently living on rice, beans, and pasta. So let's say that your cheapest option for beans is a 400 gram 
can of red kidney beans which costs you 80 cents. There are half a dozen other different brands of beans, ranging from like $1.60 to $2.50. So the overall average price of a can of beans, the overall mean, is let's say $1.95, not $1.99, I can write, honest. Now, because of like changes in production, whatever else, it is no longer profitable for Coles or Woolies to stock this 80 cent can of beans. So they take it off the shelves. Your next cheapest option is a dollar sixty can of beans. So the price of beans for you has doubled. This would give you a bean CPI of two hundred, which corresponds to a hundred percent inflation. Yep. But the average price of beans when they do this is actually only two dollars and five cents. So this increase of ten cents is much less noticeable than for you what's been an increase of 100% or 80 cents. Yeah. So the CPI as calculated would be 205, sorry, $2.05 divided by 1.95 times 100, which is 100, oops, 105.1, which comes out to 5.1% inflation. This inflation metric and the CPI metric more generally greatly underestimate the impact of this price change for the poorest people. What Monroe has done is look at a whole range of different products and make a comparison of the budget options available to people over the years. They found that of 400 products originally available from in a budget range from Asda, this was some years ago, only 87 are still available. And that reflects a huge increase in the cost of those basic things to the very poorest people. Yeah. They also found things like bag size change while cost remains the same. So one example was a one kilo bag of rice, which was uh, 45 pence, 45 cents. Uh, now there are only 500 gram bags of rice available and the price has gone up. And now that they are a pound, let's see if I can do the pound sign. Oh, <laughs> this is an increase of like cost for the same amount of product of 344 percent yeah it's more than trebled like you can see that happening for rice and for beans and for pasta if these are the things that you are eating on centerlink but also like power is going up transport costs are going up the availability of like support for people is going down and in the uk this is leading to an explosion of really horrendous poverty. Yeah. So it is quite shocking just how much the quality of life is declining over there. Um, is this where you also get slightly dodgy neoliberal arguments about like uh, the kind of price to calorie ratio of uh, cheese McDonald's cheeseburgers and things like that? No, I don't, or at least I don't know. Do tell. I'm curious now. <laughs> uh, I've seen from like very like mainstream neoliberal economists talk like talking about how um, brilliant the the McDonald's cheeseburger is in terms of being something that is high in calories and low in, low in costs in term and that that is like uh, um, that has been like a step forward in the world in some way. So they've never once talked to anybody, a doctor or a dietitian or something, about what people actually need in their diet? Apparently not. <laughs> this is one of the things that leads to what's known as malobesity. So this is a combination of malnutrition and obesity, which is a growing problem amongst the poorest communities, places like the UK, Australia, US. Uh, it's more common in the US, a uh, growing problem in the UK, because you have food deserts over there, which are regions that have very limited access to food. Absolutely. So what happens is that the cheapest foodstuffs available are like your snack foods and your sugary drinks, effectively. So these are high in, uh, they're very fatty, very sugary, very salty. And they're just generally low in actual nutritional value in terms of vitamins, minerals, whatever else you need. They can give you energy to get through the day, and they're often extremely convenient, which helps if you have five jobs to get through to pay rent or whatever else, which a lot of people wind up doing. So they become a very convenient food that gives you the energy to get through your five jobs, but they call literally malnutrition. So they cause like obesity in the sense that 
they are chemically composed in a way which does not help weight problems, if you will. But they also, because they are so devoid of nutrient value, you literally get malnutrition as a result. Yeah. And it's real bad. And economists, of course, being people who don't look beyond the numbers, don't see that. Jack Munro, among others, have been pushing the Office of National Statistics, which is the UK equivalent to the ABS, to adapt its metrics of inflation to better reflect how economic stratification changes the impact of people. And they've been successful too. In January, the ONS announced that they are changing their methodology for reporting on cost of food and other things and inflation. As part of their efforts, Munro has been constructing what they call a Vimes Boots Poverty Index, which is a reference to work by the late Terry Pratchett. One of Pratchett's characters, Sam Vimes, has a theory of economic unfairness, which is different to the CPI, but also worth talking about. Inflation measures how the price of an individual item changes. Vimes' theory is about how often you have to buy things and how that reflects the overall price. The fundamental idea is that poor people can't afford durable stuff, so they wind up paying repeatedly for less expensive things that break and wind up spending more money. As written, Vimes compares $10 boots that you have to buy every year because they fall apart to $50 boots that last you a decade. So over 10 years, the person buying these $10 boots has spent $100 because they have to buy 10 pairs of boots. But the person who can afford a $50 pair of boots has only spent $50. And this person with their $50 boots probably has dry feet too, whereas the $10 boots are going to fall apart and make your feet wet. Yeah, I would say though that um, in a modern context, it doesn't matter if you get the expensive boots or the cheap boots, they're all made in the same sweatshops. It's just, <laughs> yes, but uh, there is difference in quality. Like, yeah. Yeah, this is still relevant. Um, I wouldn't say it's so much about food, if we're looking at the Consumer Price Index, but it does relate to things like furniture, clothing, and transport. Certainly appliances. Oh definitely. yeah, for sure. But like, cheap cars uh, can be notoriously difficult to keep on the road. That's not relatable. <laughs> Hello dear listener, this next bit is something I completely forgot to write when we initially recorded this video, so I wrote it and recorded it later on, which is why it may seem a slightly disconnected from the introduction. Anyway, please enjoy. Earlier I mentioned that the CPI doesn't actually determine the cost of labour, because that's calculated based on prices once the capitalists have extracted surplus value. Instead, for wages we have the Wage Price Index or the WPI as opposed to CPI. It's a collection of four related numbers used to represent the cost of labour. So the four statistics are ordinary time as an hourly rate, uh, with and without bonuses. So this is uh, two statistics, one with bonuses, one without bonuses, and total hourly rates with and without bonuses. So your total hourly rates include things like penalty rates, allowance for special conditions, that sort of thing. Time and a half or double time are included in the totally hour total hourly rates. Yeah. Like the CPI, this is calculated quarterly by the ABS here in Australia as a weighted average. The weighting here comes from classes of similar jobs. So your accountants or cleaners or managers get grouped together and the proportion of money that goes to them is used as the weighting. But there are some wrinkles in this. The target population for data collection is employers, not employees. So the ABS is relying on employers accurately reporting what they pay people. I uh, don't know if you've looked at all, given your uh, interests, at the history of employers, whether or not they actually pay people, and whether or not they are honest about that. But it's a bit laughable, really. Certainly I didn't spend five years of my life working well under minimum wage. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so the most precarious, underplay, underpaid and exploited people are probably not on these books for this. Like, any cash in hand job is not going to show up. Probably, anyway. I'm sure somebody out there is diligently reporting cash, their cash in hand employees, pays them the full minimum wage with all of their uh, accoutrement and that sort of thing. There are also issues with who is counted. Among the employing organisations, so your employers, it explicitly excludes agriculture, forestry and fishing. Not only these guys, but specifically these guys. 
Now, agriculture there is particularly problematic because so many people working as fruit and vegetable pickers and the like are grossly underpaid for what they do. And in fact, I believe it was only last year that Australia finally got rid of piecework pay for agriculture in favour of a minimum hourly wage. It's almost like agribusiness relies on horrendously exploited workers in order to make money. And then the banks, if they are a small farm, then the banks are relying on that horrendously underpaid and exploited migrant workers to make interest back on mortgages and rent and uh, loans. Well, also, we have a fantastic situation here where if you do farm work, that can be used as a guarantee to get a visa. And I'm sure yeah. that hasn't been exploited by anyone. <laughs> Not all employees are even counted, even among the target employing organisations, non-exhaustively. It excludes people who are on commission only and what it calls non-maintainable positions. So those which last less than six months of the year. So this means if you are perennially on short-term six-month contracts through some sort of like agency or whatever, or being pushed towards these kind of shit jobs thanks to Centrelink, then your underpayment or what is probably going to be dog shit wages for you aren't going to be counted in this wage price index. I think all up it's pretty fair to say that this statistic overestimates the cost of labour. It certainly does not represent any kind of income growth because like like CPI this is used to calculate how that changes over time. It does not represent that for the most marginal workers. And uh, while your executive pay may be going up and salaried executives are, are included in this, the people on the ground, much less. And because salaried executives account for so much expenditure, that looks like wages are going up more than they actually are. But why would we pay people who actually Produce do value. the work? Oh, well, you see, if, if you pay them properly, they won't aspire to be CEOs. <laughs> Okay, so that is our discussion of CPI. As you can see, it's somewhat limited in its application and we really do need other metrics for poverty, particularly when we're dealing with times of crisis as they are in the UK. Thanks, austerity. We have a real treat for our mailbag today. This is another chart from Twitter that a bunch of people sent me to make me angry. Here it is. I actually broke my Twitter self-containment policy and replied to this tweet to ask about the chart, but uh, Stephen Hamilton here did not respond, like, or subscribe, <laughs> which is very rude. What he's doing here is he's talking about uh, COVID cases, hospitalizations, ICU, and deaths in New South Wales. He plotted something over time, you can see on the x-axis here, and on the y-axis you have some numbers. There are a few problems with this chart. Uh, I do think it's attempting to show something interesting, give a comparison between Delta and Omicron outbreaks in New South Wales. The problem is how Steve here, Mr. Shamiltonian, chooses to compare the statistics he's using. For the people listening to the audio only, he's got lines of numbers of hospitalization, ICU, and daily deaths from September 2021 to February 2022 on the same chart. What he's done here, what this uh, little delta peak index to 100 note means, is that he has chosen to put the delta peak of each of those metrics, hospitalizations, ICU, and daily deaths, at zero on the x-axis here, and at 100 on the y-axis. So what he means is that these lines represent a percentage compared to the delta peak for each statistic. So. He hasn't actually written that on the y-axis. Mr. Shamilton, you should label your axes better. I mean, by calling himself Shamilton, it seems like he's labelled it pretty well, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Shamiltonian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can just write percentage of delta peak there. Without that, it's very easy to look at this and think, oh, these are numbers of people, which is made all the more confusing by stacking these on top of each other. We did not, in fact, have the same number of daily deaths at Delta Peak as we did hospitalizations or people in ICU. My guess for why he did this is that it can be difficult to compare the far smaller number of deaths to the number of hospitalizations if you put straight numbers of people in this. So if you have, say, five deaths per day, that's going to be down here, whereas if you have like 150 people in hospital, that's going to be up here. So comparing the two on the same graph is hard. Maybe that means you should be using separate graphs, Mr. Shamilton. Yeah. <laughs> if you mistakenly think these are people, numbers of people, which is, again, an easy mistake to make, it looks like there are about 350 deaths per day in 
mid-January. More deaths than has happened nationally on any day, and more than there are people in ICU or hospitalizations. Oh. Y- yeah, <laughs> right? That's why this is so confusing. This would also imply that there are a shitload of people dying at home. The numbers on here are very confusing. It's not well structured to give people the information that they would like to take from this. There's another wrinkle here. The peak of deaths, ICU, and hospitalization didn't actually occur on the same day for Delta. So despite this labeling on the x-axis, not all of these curves actually start on the 20th of September. I asked uh, Mr. Shamilton in here what he had done to shift that starting point, and he never replied to me. Very rude. I think it's a relevant question. So I went and had a look up at a summary of government data from uh, covid19data.com.au. They cite their sources. It does come from government data. And it gives the peaks from New South Wales. So for hospitalizations, the date of the peak was the 21st of the 9th, 2021. And the number of people hospitalized was 1,268. For ICU, it was on the... Well, there were two peaks, uh, on the 12th of the 9th and on the 22nd of the 9th, and the peak number was 242. I say this is Delta peak. And for the deaths, we had 15 on the 29th of the 9th and the 1st of the 10th. I am guessing that uh, based on the fact that these all go down from here, he's picked these. Yeah. But those are still not the same date and are not the 20th of September, Stephen. (laughs) (laughs) So this this x-axis is just bullshit. I also think that he's applied some smoothing to the hospitalization and ICU numbers. Because if you look, like, the deaths you can see wiggle up and down a whole bunch, right? Whereas the hospitalizations and the ICU are very smooth curves, despite the fact that if you look at the daily numbers, it's not that smooth. Yeah. He hasn't said that he's done any smoothing to this Shambletonian. But also, why is why is he not smooth deaths if he's going to smooth the? Uh, yeah, right. The other like, two. like my guess is that because doing so, whoopsie, would uh, make the peak less d- dramatic because you'd probably see something looking like this. Yeah. But again, if you're going to do this, at least say you're doing it. All right, that is us for today. If you enjoy what we do here, if you think it's worth some money, please, we would love to have it. Go over to Patreon. The link is in the description. Uh, If you sign up at the $5 tier or above, you also get access to our bonus episodes. If you sign up the $10 tier, I will start releasing uh, episodes early when I actually produce them a bit more regularly. At At the moment, nobody's at that tier, so I haven't been bothering. Sorry. So you can get earlier access to these episodes because we do at least record them a few weeks theoretically, before they're meant to be released. But thank you so much for coming on again. As ever, thank you for having me. And I will talk to you next time. Speak to you then.